Rio Grande announces a change in time for calling all cars, the West's most popular broadcast. Beginning Sunday, April 2nd, calling all cars will be heard at 8 to 8.30 p.m. on Sundays instead of Fridays. Listen to Calling All Cars, 8 to 8.30, Sunday night, April 2nd. Copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Marysville police calling all cars. Attention all cars to broadcast 277 regarding a kidnapping. Be on the lookout for a sedan bearing three men and a woman. These men kidnapped a Marysville policeman this day. Exercise caution as they are armed and dangerous. That's all. Rolls and quit. <laughs> water pipe bursts, you don't send for a radio repairman. If something goes wrong with your radio, you don't call in a plumber. You summon the man whose training and experience have made him a specialist in his chosen line. The men who do know gasoline, whose very occupations require them to drive far more than you or I, are the men at the wheels of police cars, ambulances, and fire engines. And the way they size up the various motor fuels on the market is best illustrated by the fact that more of their emergency, public-serving automobiles are powered by Rio Grande Crack, wherever it is sold, than any other brand. Their constant reliance on this better gasoline to get them away to a quicker start, to give them top speed, maximum power, and the kind of mileage that saves the taxpayers' money is the most eloquent endorsement ever accorded to gasoline. Tens of thousands of motorists who have followed the example of an overwhelmingly large number of city and county officials in California are enjoying the advantages of police car performance Rio Grande Crack in their automobiles. If you are not, why not? Get a tank full on the way to work in the morning. Give it one trial and you'll be sold. You'll understand why Rio Grande Crack is the most highly recommended gasoline sold in the West. The facts in the story we are to hear tonight have been taken in the main from the confidential files of the Police Department of Marysville, California. We have therefore asked Chief of Police Daryl LaForte to prepare a foreword to our program. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a privilege to be able tonight to greet you as a guest of Calling All Cars. It is part of the cooperation which law enforcement agencies are showing in their effort tonight to point out the losing nature of life of crime. Such cooperation between law enforcement officers and all others in this work is vital to the success of the battle against crime. If every group of authorities seek only to cover themselves with glory and refuse to cooperate with other groups, the criminal element has a distinct advantage. The story we are about to hear was brought to a successful conclusion by the splendid way in which all peace officers involved work together to prove again and most conclusively, that crime cannot pay. A low moon hung over the little desert town of Battle Mountain, Nevada. It was long after midnight, 1.30 o'clock in the early morning of July 15, 1932. At the upper end of the town, two men were working furtively in the shadows as they attempted to break the lock of Battle Mountain's leading store, while a third stood beside a small sedan parked nearby. Are you making that good? Okay, okay. A couple more cries on him. Well, here. Put it somewhere, will you? I want to get through that. I thought I heard something down there by the corner of the building. Is it getting jumpy, Chick? I can't hear anything. Yeah, maybe so. I could have sworn I heard someone near. And if there was anybody around, Henry to see them. But you suppose I'm making them stand at it by the car. Yeah, yeah, sure, I know. There. One more like that, we'll have the luck, I thought. Now give me a bit hey, Jack, there is somebody coming. I just saw a shadow on that on the sidewalk. I've got a pick and listen. Here. You hear that? Come on. Tuck behind us, Sedan, and quick. He's still coming. I guess he saw us all right. Hey, why didn't you tip us, Henry? Hey, Jim, you fellas said Jack. I think he's going to get the signal when we look back here. Okay. Well, hold your guns ready, boy. I got a hunch it's a cop. All right, you fellas. Put up your hands and come out in the open. It's the law. It's the marshal, boss. Yeah, I know. Let him have it, boys. Oh, 
Now, one of us caught him, Chuck. He stopped in his track. And we must only wing him. He's firing at us. Well, you know what to do, don't you? That ought to hold him. Come on! Duck into the saddle. Did anybody here in the crowd see who was doing all that shooting? Yeah, I seen it, Constable. There's three guys shooting it out with some other fella. They beat it down that alley there. Okay, some of you men come with me and we'll try to head them off. Look, Constable, there's a fella they shot, man, there by the corner of the store. See if there's anything you can do for him. Yeah, bro. I'm going to try to catch up with the guys who shot him. Can you see who it is? Not scared, but... Yeah. Yeah, it's Marshal Chiara. Good old two-gun beat Chiara. He killed him. Yeah. Looks like it to me. Uh-huh. He got back at him a little. I saw one of the killers limping pretty bad when they went in that alley there. You, you think he might have shot one of them? That's the way it looked. Well, funny that you run off and leave the car standing here. That ain't their car. It belongs to some people I know. It just happened to be parked there. Well, it looks like they got away. A lot of the boys are still searching for them, but no luck so far. They got away, huh, Constable? Yeah, we'll get them yet. They left their tracks in the alley. The tracks of cowboys' boots. <laughs> Shortly after his arrival at the scene of Marshal Chiara's tragic killing, Sheriff James Moore of Lander County sent a rush call to Detective Richard Heath at Reno. Detective Heath immediately uncovered two important clues. A limp, plainly discernible in one of the bandit's tracks, and an excellent palm print from the center of the park automobile. But it remained for M.A. Carpenter, a detective of Marysville, California, to give meaning to these clues. Were you able to make anything out of what Heath dug up, Mr. Carpenter? I certainly was, Sheriff. Plenty. You got a lead out of that palm print? No, not the palm print. Identifying the killer through that would be mostly a matter of luck. What the track? That's it, exactly. Those boot prints showing the limp. What about them? Sheriff, only one man in the West makes boot tracks like that. And that man is Jack Weston. Jack Weston? You mean the man they call the last outlaw of the Old West? That's just who I mean. But uh, how can you be sure? Besides the evidence of those boot prints, Jack Weston is the only man... I know who could outdraw two gun Pete Sierra. If that's the case, he's going to be a tough man to catch. That may be, but none of them are too tough to be caught eventually. I followed Weston's career since way back in 1900 when he and his brother Ed started out stealing horses in the state of Washington. He's been getting away with his lawlessness for a long time now, Mr. Carpenter. I don't know what's Jack hasn't him. entirely gotten away with it. He's done time before, and when we get him this time, he'll likely hang. And if he keeps on leaving a trail of telltale boot prints, we'll have him before you know it. But nearly three months passed, and still nothing definite has been learned as to Jack Weston's whereabouts. And then, late one October afternoon of the same year, an automobile bearing Arizona license plates turned into a service station on the outskirts of Marysville, California. In your tank, sir? Yeah. Make it snappy. Yes, sir. Don't you think you should have stopped further along, Jack? After all, we just cleaned this dicky town a change of over 500 and phony bills. Shut up, will you, Chick? Oh, that service station got to hear you. Oh, no, but just the same. Oh, we were down to the last gallon. I didn't want to take no chances of running out between stations. Where to now, Jack? I'm not sure yet. Let's see how things look up ahead. I may cut east back into Nevada. Then you're going to pass up Red Bluff? I told you I didn't know, didn't I? A pipe down. I wish that guy would hurry up. I want to get clear of this town. Oh, it's just coughing, Chick. And he's going to bother us. Hey there. Never mind the oil. In a hurry. Okay, sir. That's two dollars and sixteen cents. Here you are. Thank you, sir. Let's see that two fifteen out of the corner. Look, that guy, another one of the phonies, eh? Sure. Why not? Oh. Look what's coming around the corner of the station. Jack, it's a cop. He's looking hard in our direction. All right, so it's a cop. What of it? I swear he's the biggest cop I ever saw in my life. I uh, bet he weighs way over 200. Jack, yes. he's coming over here. Yeah, let's beat it, Jack. Nuts to the chain. Now listen, you two hold tight. I'll take care of this. Just a minute, there. I want to talk to you. Yeah? What's the matter? Where'd you get that automobile? What do you mean, wait, I get it? Don't you me. Yeah? You see your registration slip? Sure. Right here on the wheel post. Sure, yeah. Your name, sir? All right, copper. I guess you know a 45 when you see one. I climb into the back seat like a good boy. Hey, what the... You heard me, big boy. Okay. Plates and... What? Well, they're headed...
heading north on the Bangor Road, it looks like. You better take it easy, Jack. We're doing close to 90. We'll have everybody... Oh, never mind the speedometer. Keep your gun on that cop, you fool. It's right, Jack. We can't take the Now, will you two shut up? I'm heading for a turn-off in case anyone saw us kidnap the Flatfoot. And there'd be an alarm by now. Yeah, but... Uh... Oh, but nothing. I want to get to that turn-off before they string a blockade out. After that, we're really okay. Oh, yeah? That's what you think, Mr. Hi, Don Copper. You think you're going to get away with this? You're crazy. Listen, Flatfoot, don't worry about us. We'll be all right. You better start worrying about yourself. Because that two-ton frame of yours is going to be rotten in the underbrush before long. You mean, you mean you're going to kill him, Jack? Sure, I'm going to kill him. You don't think I'd let him go so he could blab all he knows? Oh, yes, but Jack, oh, I... Oh, stop whining. I'm running the show. He can't be very far to that turn-off, nothing. Hey, Jack, look out. There's a car pulling out of that side road. Right Wait in front of us. Dirty rat. It's a bucket. Maybe I can make a turn. Hey, Jack, we're going to turn over. <laughs> Anybody hurt? Uh, I don't think so. Are you all right, kid? Yeah, I guess so. Shook up a little as well. Come on, let's get out of here. What about the copper? All right, done for. Look at him. Yeah, I guess you're right, chick. Well, let's get going. Thanks for the wood, sir. Okay, Jack. We're right behind you. When the officers under Sheriff Poland reached the scene of the accident, the fugitives had already disappeared. Fortunately, however, they found Officer Merrill LeBuff, nearly unconscious from a head injury. Not dead, as the bandits had supposed. Days of intensive search proved unavailing. Luck was again riding with Jack Weston in his outfit. The year 1932 came to an end. 1933 rolled by, and Jack Weston still remained at liberty. And then, in the spring of 1934, Sheriff Lewis R. Fife of Cedar City, Utah, decided to take the bull by the horn. I tell you, these wool robberies have got to stop. The ranchers around here have taken about all they can stand. Something's got to be done, and done soon. I'd be willing to bet my last dime I know who's behind all this. Yeah, who? Jack Weston. By George, Sheriff, I, I believe you're right. I'm almost certain I'm right. Yeah, he's the bandit who killed your old friend, uh, Marshal Pete Sierra, up at Battle Mountain, isn't he? Yeah. That's something I'm not forgetting. And one of these days, if somebody else doesn't get him first, I'm going to bring Weston in, dead or alive. Pardon me a minute. Hello, Sheriff Fife speaking. This is the Stoner Ranch calling, Sheriff. Yeah. We've just discovered the theft of several thousand dollars worth of wool. Any idea who did it? Well, no, unless it's those wool thieves have been operating around here this spring. Okay, I'll be right out. Unless I'm very much mistaken, it's Weston in his outfit again. They've robbed the Stoner Ranch. Yes. Yeah. Come on, let's get on out there. I'm going to bring in those wool thieves if it's the last thing I ever do. On investigation of the robbery at the Stoner Ranch, Sheriff Fife's only clue was the diamond studded tire mark of a truck. A clue which he followed across dark desert country for nearly a month. And then, early one morning, near the abandoned home state mine, 30 miles west of Cedar City, he came across the now familiar tracks leading to an arroyo and knew that at last he had his quarry cornered. Leaving his car, Sheriff Fife cautiously drew his 45 and advanced toward a small truck that was partially concealed by a growth of mesquite. As he came up to it and peered around the front of the motor, his eyes fell on a middle-aged man and young woman lying fast asleep on the ground, almost at his feet. For a moment, Sheriff Fife studied the man's features and then... All right, Weston, get up. Huh? Oh, none of that, Weston. I wouldn't reach for that gun if I were you. Okay, Sheriff. Your party. Leave your gun on the ground where it is and keep your hands up. Here's the girl, too. What do we do, Jack? Whatever the sheriff says, I reckon. Now get on down the gully there, both of you. My car's only a couple hundred yards away. What about the truck? There's plenty of time to take care of the truck, Weston. I'm going to toss a pair of handcuffs over to you, sister. I want you to put them on him. Shall I, Jack? Sure. What else can you do? All right, hurry it up. Now then, get moving. Okay, okay. Don't get such a stew. Yeah, just keep ahead of me there and no tricks. Yeah. I'm sorry about the handcuffs, Jack. That's all right, Daisy. Think nothing of it. I'm not going to... No, you don't, Weston. Stop! Stop, or I'll shoot! Go on, Jack! Go on! Get away from him! Oh! Oh, you've killed him! You dirty rat! You've killed him! Maybe I have. If I did, he asked for it. I'm going after my car. Don't try to get away because it won't do you any good. I won't be but a minute, and you take it easy. Weston, don't die. We'll get him patched up when we get back to town. Jack! Jack, Jack, what I told you now, no funny business. Daisy, now shut up and listen. The minute he gets out of sight, 
back to the truck. Bring me my shot. Can you get it? Okay, please. Uh, the last hadn't pumped a slug into my back, I told myself. Does it hurt very bad, Jeff? Never mind that. Did you have a cigarette? Yeah. And B didn't get that shot. Okay. No. Oh. I'll make that filthy shirt pay for this. Just you wait, wise guy, just wait. Are you all right, Jeff? The shotgun in my hands, I'm always all right. Now, shut up. My turn now, Sheriff. Huh? Get him up and be quick about it. Oh, what? Hey, you heard me. Get him up. Okay, Weston. Kind of looks like your luck still holds, doesn't it? Sure, why not? Get the keys these bracelets from Daisy. Get him. Look out! Daisy, that six gun there on the ground. I'm getting you, Jeff. All right. Get back to you and drop that shotgun. Had a go, Daisy. But there's other pair of handcuffs on him, Jeff. Yeah, what for? What did I fool around with him? Why not shoot him? That's what he deserves. Just the same, Jackie. You were lucky getting out of the way of that shotgun charge, Sheriff. But it won't happen again. You're all through, see? Here, Daisy. Give me a gun. No, I've got a better idea, honey. We'll handcuff him around one of them trees. This lug is going to die a slow death. Well, you've got brains, sugar. Hey, this tree right here is as good as any. Once about a foot thick. Now, get over there, Sheriff. The lady's going to make you nice and comfortable. <laughs> Do you really mean you'd do a thing like this to anyone western? Why, Sure. Now, get your arms around that tree trunk. No, I'm not there. Under the big branch. There. That's it. Now. There. That ought to hold you for a while, Sheriff. Now, come on, Jeff. Let me help you up again. Let's beat it out of here. Beat it nothing. Get some gasoline out of the truck, Daisy. Gasoline? Sure. I'm going to pour it over this dirty rat and set him on fire. Oh, Jack, no. I said yes. Then do what I say. I'm going to burn him alive. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to... Jack. No. Jack, what is it? It's a slug. I guess maybe I... It was my thought. Yes. So hold on to me, darling. I'll get you to the sheriff's oh. car somehow. Oh, take it easy. Take it easy. I will, dear. It's just this kept... Uh, if it wasn't for this... Confound it. Put it in my back. Stay here and watch that skunk dry. Here we are, Jack. Uh. Now, let me help you up. Oh. There, now. You'll be all right. Yeah, sure. sure. Now, let's get out of here. You're not really going to leave me here like this, are you? What do you think, Copper? Don't you realize what that means? Sure I do, and I'm only sorry it won't be worse. You can't let me die like this. It is human. In heaven's name, shoot me. Shoot me, but don't leave me out here to go mad. Shoot you? Oh, no. That would be much too good for you. So long, Sheriff. Oh, my. Oh, my. 
pray. Mount Trumbull. 
The other five advance to the door. What? Why, it's you, but... Yeah. But I thought... You thought I'd be fooled for the buzzers by this time, didn't you? You said you're under arrest for attempted murder, young woman. I see. All right. I'll go with you. Where's Jack Weston? He ain't here. Ain't here, eh? Come on, we're going to take a look through the house. If you see for yourself, there's no one in this room. There's but two other rooms in the house. Well, we'll take a look at him anyway. Hey, what's your name? Margaret Carter. Margaret Carter. Why'd Jack call you Daisy? If you don't like my name, you know what you can do? Come on now, where's Jack Weston? Jack is far away. Well, I'm going to find out. You were right about his not being in the house, but I got a hunch he's not far from here. Well, one of the men just found your car, Jim. He did, eh? What about Weston, Captain? There's no sign of Weston. All right, let's take a look at the car. Come on, Daisy, or Margaret, or whatever your name is. Okay. You see, the car's right there by that clump of mesquite. Oh, yeah. What are the men digging over there for? They found a place where the earth had been disturbed. Thought maybe Weston might have buried something there. <laughs> well, what's that for? What's the matter with you? Oh, nothing, nothing. Hey, Sheriff, it's a body we just found in that pit. The boys are bringing it out now. A body? Well, who's, you know? Well, there, the, the boys have it out. Maybe someone can identify it. Why? Why, it's Jack Weston. Yes, it's Jack. I buried him there myself. <laughs> He died during the night on, on a trip south from St. George. Well, looks like that bullet of yours got him after all, Sheriff Hyde. Yeah, I guess it did. And it left the West that much better place to live in. In just a moment, we shall present the concluding facts regarding our program. A careful driver not only keeps one eye on the road and the other on his speedometer, he is just as careful about where he turns in for his motoring needs. A veritable army of prudent, thoughtful motorists watch for the nearest red and white Rio Grande station, knowing the safer, surer protection of Rio Lube and Rio Grande, Pennsylvania, knowing the superior quality of Rio Grande crack, the gasoline of real police car performance. Every member of Jack Weston's outfit has been apprehended by the authorities either before or since the death of their leader, and is now serving time in prison. They are learning, as Jack Weston so conclusively learned, that crime cannot pay. Marysville Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. The cancellation of broadcast 277 regarding a kidnapping. Suspects in this case are now in custody. That's all. Rolls and clear. The role of Sheriff Fife in tonight's broadcast was played by Frederick Keel. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsay, bidding you good night for Leo Grande. Rio Grande announces a change in time for Calling All Cars, the West's most popular broadcast. Beginning Sunday, April 2nd, Calling All Cars will be heard at 8 to 8.30 p.m. on Sundays instead of Fridays. Listen to Calling All Cars, 8 to 8.30 Sunday night starting April 2nd, at which time you will hear the story of Earl Durand, the Wyoming desperado who was shot today. This is the Columbia Broadcast.